It is a race of great length and many moods. It begins in late afternoon and quickly plunges into an unnerving twilight zone of artificial light. Dawn will reveal the battle damage of the night. Cars streaked with oil. Others showing contact with other cars or the wall. A few missing altogether. Then, from that first light to the race's end, lie the tense last hours. Those who have come so far, always knowing that the hard-earned equity of laps run guarantees nothing. This is the toughest of all the endurance classics, and it is the first major race worldwide of the year. Teams typically use road racing specialists as well as the best from Indy and NASCAR, who used to treat this race as a tune-up for their own series, but who now consider victory here an end in itself. The cars are divided into classes, stock appearing but highly modified GT cars, and the specialized built for racing only Daytona prototypes, a dangerous mix of fast and faster. The track's defining feature, the banking, looms large in the flat Daytona landscape, walling off the rest of the world and creating one of its own. In this world, the essence of long-distance racing. Everyone who races here shares the idea of winning, but to actually become a winner, you must first go the distance. The 24 hours of Daytona, and it starts next. You don't have to be a race fan to appreciate the charms of Florida in January. Temperatures in the mid-70s, blue sunny skies, and ocean breezes. Welcome to Speed's live coverage of one of the world's greatest motorsports events now beginning its second half century, the Rolex 24 at Daytona. You're looking live at pit lane where the field of 56 cars is all lined up and swamped by some of the tens of thousands of fans who have made their own personal journey here to Daytona. Hello everybody, I'm Bob Varsha. We have 15 hours of coverage coming your way here on Speed. We'll take you up to 11 p.m. Eastern tonight and rejoin you at 9 a.m. Eastern tomorrow to take you through to the finish and beyond. And during the nighttime hours, we'll have live streaming at speed.com with audio provided by our friends at Motor Racing Network. Work. Now, you might ask yourself, why would any racing driver want to race twice around the clock? Aside from the chance to win this beauty and the Rolex watch that goes with it. The reason is the field. A great gathering of drivers from across motorsports, experience in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, GT racing, motorcycles, and more from across the world. And leading the NASCAR contingent in this year's Rolex 24 is one of the most experienced of all. Juan Pablo Montoya is in the Ganassi 01 BMW Riley Daytona prototype, sharing the car with defending series champions Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas, who also happen to be the winningest driving duo in Grand Am Rolex Series history, and IndyCar's Charlie Kimball. JPM will be trying for his third Rolex 24 win. Ganassi NASCAR driver Jamie McMurray, the 2010 Daytona 500 winner, is among the drivers in the second Ganassi DP, the 02. More on that in a moment. In the GT category, 2012 NASCAR Sprint Cup runner-up Clint Boyer and two-time Daytona 500 champion Michael Waltrip will co-drive a Waltrip Racing Ferrari alongside Rob Kaufman and Rui Aguas. Nelson Piquet Jr., who had a breakout season in 2012, winning for the first time in both the Nationwide and Truck Series, will be a co-driver of the number five Action Express Corvette DP. And A.J. Allmendinger returns to Daytona as the defending champion of this event, along with John Pugh and Justin Wilson. Oz Negri was also part of Michael Shank Racing's winning squad last year, but he was hurt in a training accident, so Marcos Ambrose has been brought in to help out as well. To Matt Yoakum. Bob, that win was the pinnacle of A.J. Allmendinger's career so far. It took place in a season that quickly unraveled, though, due to an issue with NASCAR substance abuse policy. But back here at the beach, A.J., describe your emotions driving through the tunnel once again. Uh, I mean, uh, once you've been into victory lane here at Daytona, it's been uh, it's just an amazing feel to drive back through uh, back through the garage and, and uh, through the tunnel. And, you know, it, it's kind of strange because this was the pinnacle of my career, and it was also where it all kind of started to unravel. So uh, with help with my uh, family and friends, great people like Michael Shank, Roger Pansky, all those people that have stuck by me. It's, uh, it's a great feeling. I'm ready to go do it twice in a row. 
many are predicting an epic pace and a record number of laps led what's your biggest concern today oh it's just like always you know i think the only thing you can do is control the fate that's in your own hands don't drive off the racetrack don't run into gt traffic uh, you just got to be patient for 24 hours that's what we did last year if something breaks something breaks but uh, just control what's in your own hands making sure that this beautiful michael shank race car this ford riley stays perfect like this go win this thing one more time good luck thank you aj almendinger starts from row three in a field consisting of many of his old mates from open wheel bob Indy 500 champions Dario Franchitti and Scott Dixon are in the 0-2 Ganassi DP, joined by Joey Hand and Jamie McMurray. That team will be strong as Franchitti, Dixon, and Hand are all former Rolex 24 champions. Defending IndyCar Series champion Ryan Hunter Ray is driving for Wayne Taylor Racing, teamed with Max Angelelli and Jordan Taylor in the number 10 Velocity Worldwide Corvette DP. 2003 Champ Car Champion Paul Tracy headlines the driver lineup in the Doran Racing number 77 DP. And Tony Kanaan, the 2004 IndyCar Titleist, along with his close friend, Formula One star Rubens Barrichello, will head up the number 21 Brazilian Porsche GT team. Now to Chris Neville. Well, Bob, it was an amazing season finale at the IndyCar race in Fontana for Ryan Hunter Ray. An early race crash for Will Power meant Ryan Hunter Ray had to consistently check in with his team to see what the point situation was. And in the end, he was the champion. Ryan, that was a wild night. Have you had a chance to reflect on that championship and the opportunities that it has brought? We've had some time to reflect, but nothing can really prepare you for, for kind of what, what you're faced on a night like that with so much pressure, um, it, especially coming down to the last lap. I mean, that, I really learned a lot about myself, our team. I'm um, just so happy for everybody involved, and I feel, I feel lucky to be involved with the people that have helped, uh, helped get me to this point. But um, it's great to be back here after everything we accomplished. You know, in 2012, it's great to be back here with Chevy and, and Daytona 24. Well, this will be his seventh year in the row running in this race. He's still looking for his first watch. Bob? All right, thank you, Chris. Now, recent history tells us to win the Rolex 24, you have to beat the guys from Chip Ganassi Racing with Fila Sabatis. Winners of this race overall in four of the last seven years. Last year, they missed the podium entirely, but they're back with a vengeance, and they swept the front row in qualifying. Coming up, we'll talk to a driver making his return to racing after breaking his back in this crash last year at Le Mans. We'll look back at last year's Rolex 24, the 50th anniversary race, and one of the greatest in history. He just basically made sure I was never there again and just kind of ran me off the racetrack, and at that point, that kind of pissed me off a little bit. And we'll introduce you to some of the other drivers, teams, and manufacturers hoping to win this year's race. The 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona pre-race returns after this. Welcome back to an event that presents a magic combination of a classic race and a legendary circuit. The Rolex 24 at Daytona is presented by Rolex, official timekeeper of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Brought to you in part by WeatherTech Automotive Accessories. Shop WeatherTech.com today. And by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence. Since 1962, some of the best drivers in the world from Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, sports car, even a couple of World Rally Champions have made their way through this famous tunnel to compete for a grueling 24 hours here. Why? Because it's a race unlike any other. From the outstanding high speeds of the NASCAR banking through to the twisty, tricky infield section, with up to five drivers in each car, supported by an army of passionate crew, combining skill and risk trying to win this race. Which is why the Rolex 24 can only take place here at Daytona International Speedway. Who better than Justin Bell, a race driver in his own right and son of three-time Rolex 24 winner Derek Bell to describe what it means to a driver to compete here at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. The grid has been cleared. Soon it will be just the cars and their drivers as we get set to launch this year's Rolex 24 in about 19 minutes. This is just the start of Speed Weeks at Daytona on Speed. We'll have the stock cars in February and Bike Week in March. Our international cast of racing stars have victories at all the great Enduros. They're sprinkled liberally throughout the field, but a few deserve a special mention. 
Peter Barron's StarWorks team is led by 2012 Speed.com Driver of the Year, Ryan Dial. Last year, they had a dream season, competing and winning not only in Grand Am, but also the American Le Mans Series, the 24 Hours of Le Mans, and the World Endurance Championship. I think I did 27 races and 21 podiums, and it's just one of those seasons that you can either retire on top or you can do it all again. Yet StarWorks is looking for its first Rolex 24 win. So too was another one of its drivers, the hard-charging Scott Alan McNish, a two-time champion at Le Mans. Among the stars behind the wheel of Enzo Podolicchio's number three Corvette Daytona prototype, Anthony Davidson. The Englishman suffered a terrifying crash last year at Le Mans, getting airborne due to contact with a slower car, resulting in a broken back. The Rolex 24 marks Davidson's return to the cockpit. With more on that story, here's Andrew Marriott. Yeah, Anthony, a monstrous accident, and it's taken you a long time to recover, and you're a bit shorter too. Yeah, two centimetres, believe it or not. I really didn't need that, but uh, it's great to be back. I'm feeling fully fit again. Doesn't hurt at all in the car, and uh, yeah, it's been a pretty miraculous recovery, really, in just seven months. Now, this is a new team. You're a rookie here, so there's a lot to contend with, but you've qualified really well. Yeah, I think P9's a respectable position to be in. Uh, a lot of the team have worked together in the past, but never with this car. And uh, for Stefan Sarazan and myself, first time ever here in this type of car. So completely new event for us. And um, yeah, Stefan put it P9, like I say. Uh, since then, the car's got faster. They've taken away uh, a restrictor that we had in place for qualifying. So hopefully we'll be shooting up through the field in no time. And Anthony, you just a few moments ago did something you've never done to a car before. Maybe you'll just do it again for us. I saw Nicholas Manassian do it, one of my teammates from the old Peugeot days, of course. Uh, he kissed the car, and I thought, I'll give that a go. I've never done it before, so hopefully the, uh, the new girl can uh, be good to us. Thanks very much, Anthony. He kissed the car. Hope it brings him luck. To you, Bob. All right, thank you, Andrew. You've met some of the stars who will be racing for victory here at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. But consider, too, a large number of drivers for whom just being here is a dream and for whom raising the budget, building a car, forming a team, getting here, entering, qualifying, and finishing the Rolex 24 will be a victory in itself. Time now for more of the pre-race ceremonies, and for that, we go to the public address announcer here at Daytona, Jim Mueller. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, will you please rise and remove your hats as the Patrick Air Force Base Color Guard presents our nation's colors. Please welcome Pastor Ronnie Barton of the First Baptist Church of South Daytona to deliver today's invocation. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Rolex 24, a race of endurance and excitement. Lord, we pray for all the drivers and all the crew members that you keep them safe. Thank you for our men and women in our military. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and welcome recording artist and singer for three Cirque du Soleil International Touring Productions, Denise Stefani, as she performs our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous We're so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That our flag was still there Oh, say star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
Ladies and gentlemen. Well, our national anthem brings us one step closer to the drop of the green at the 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona, and it promises to be a great one. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Till, along with former class winners here, Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. And guys, you know that everyone in that garage area wants to win the watch. They want to endure. Endurance used to be the key, but Calvin, you and I spoke about this. The complexion of this race seems to have changed over the last couple of years. Well, it really has, Brian. We've seen some epic battles here in the final couple of hours for the past few years, some real shootouts now to be involved in that shootout you need one fast fresh race car driver and you also need that car at 100 percent so to be there you survive 20 plus hours of brutally hard racing now the cars are designed to do just that however the driver still needs to temper that ability they need to be mistake free don't run it off the racetrack don't hit anyone else but if they do dorsey then it comes down to the cruise now you're right about that it's hard to conceive of drivers driving at 10 tenths for 24 hours and not making mistake that's where crisis management comes in behind the garages where there's crash carts they're full of everything suspension bits built up for all four corners spare body work gear boxes when you leave the shop you leave nothing behind you take it all here because the team that wins this race is almost always the one that's best prepared yeah, and teamwork here probably more so than anywhere else is so important we always talk about the depth of talent in this field in the years that i've been coming here i cannot remember talent as deep for both drivers and teams as we've seen here in 2013. There are 17 entries in the Daytona prototype category. Certainly the Ganassi team has to be considered a favorite to win here, something they've done four out of the last seven years. Their lead driver is the master, Scott Pruitt, who'll be in the 01 alongside Memo Rojas, Juan Pablo Montoya, and Charlie Kimball. With a victory, Scott will tie Hurley Haywood for all-time overall wins here with five. I mean, I want to go. I want to go racing. I want to go fight it out. I want to go, you know, wheel to wheel, fender to fender, and, and do whatever it takes. The GT category has a whopping 36 entries, all competing for a class victory. And the field is stacked. There are seven Ferrari 458s, four Audi R8s, and 18 Porsches. Some of their teams include 2012 Rolex 24 and North American Endurance GT champions Magnus Racing. Kevin Buckler's TRG outfit is a four-time Rolex 24 winner, including overall in 03. The famous Bruno's 59, which is celebrating the 40th anniversary of its first overall win here back in 73. And Park Place Motorsports fastest in testing, led by the only American Porsche factory driver, Pat Long. There is only one Camaro in the field, entered by Stevenson Motorsports, but it will be strong. And Turner Motorsports entered a pair of BMW M3s, but only have a single bullet left in their gun, led by Bill Orblin, after a practice crash has made the 93 machine a non-starter. Competing at the Rolex 24 for the first time, the new GX class. Among the favorites, former GT champion Speed Source. Their number 70 Mazda 6 is powered by Skyactive Diesel, the first time a diesel-powered car has raced here. And the number 16 Napleton Porsche Cayman, both fastest in testing and qualifying with driver Shane Lewis and former 24-hour winner David Donahue leading the way. As you can see, the talent this year indeed runs deep. The 24-hour struggle to claim what many consider to be the most valuable watch in the world about to get underway. We talked about the GX pole sitter in GT. It's Nick Tandy and his Porsche on pole. And Nick Tandy is the newest member of Porsche's factory driver lineup for the year. Yeah, we talk about stars down on the grid. Clint Boyer, certainly a star on the NASCAR circuit, and he is one of the biggest characters in the NASCAR garage. It's, it's just out here having fun. You got Rob that's this high. What do they talk? It's foreign. And then you got that Rui, and then you got me. Can I just say foreign? They talk foreign, and then Michael's about a foot taller than me. <laughs> To be quite honest, I, I don't even know how they get us all in it. You know, in NASCAR, we uh, drink a lot of five-hour energy and, and eat hot dogs. I think Rob's seat actually goes inside Michael's. Who the hell knows? This hauler has an espresso machine inside that Ferrari hauler, so already we're, we're all mixed up here. You guys follow this sport? It's, it's certainly not American or redneck and ease, and, and those are the only two languages I know. That's kind of funny. Somehow we're going to have to have a translator in this deal. Jump in that baby and have some fun. Is that normal? There are obviously some aspects of sports car racing that are brand new to Clint Boyer, but you're with a great team. Coming in here this week, you actually had to be talked into even doing this race. What has this experience been like? It's been unbelievable. Uh, you know, this is a bucket list race, really is. If you're a race car driver, coming down here for the Rolex is super cool. But to be able to come down here and get our year started off uh, in, in such a neat way with both bosses, you know, Michael and, and Rob Kaufman both being, uh, you know, my teammates in this uh, adventure. 24 hours is an adventure 
for me. You know, our 500 mile races are nothing compared to this. I have no idea. I'm a little bit wound up. And I don't know why, because this is a long race. I'm not going to be able to keep this. It's definitely going to be some five hour energy in the future. Your, your team's done the race before. The Ferrari 458's done the race before. What are you most looking forward to? Tomorrow, about 3 o'clock, <laughs> seeing where we're at. You know, I will be honest, we're a little bit slow, but, um, you know, it's an attrition race. you got to stay on the racetrack and do the same things it takes to be good at the end of a 500-mile race. So uh, if we can capitalize on that, I think we can be there at the end of this thing. It's going to be a long, hard-fought battle, and we're looking forward to it. All right, Bob, well, they line up 16th on the GT grid today. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, Jamie. It's going to be really interesting to hear what Clint Boyer of NASCAR fame has to say about his first trip around Daytona International Speedway's oval and road course for 24 hours. Just about time to get things rolling, and here to give the command, one of the greatest endurance drivers of all time. Back in 1973, Hurley Haywood was a Vietnam veteran trying to make a name for himself in motorsports. He joined car owner Peter Gregg at a Porsche 911 and scored the first of his five victories in the Rolex 24. Hurley Haywood, in honor of his 40th anniversary of that first win, is our Grand Marshal. To the PA. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for those most famous words in motorsports. Here's your Grand Marshal, five-time Rolex 24 at Daytona champion, the great Hurley Haywood. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Once again, the siren sound of engines at Daytona International Speedway. Sweet to the ear, if I do say so. Welcome to our Speed Infield studio. I'm Bob Varsha. Forgive me if I sweat a bit after that long run from the pit lane. Joined by two-time Rolex 24 class winner, Tommy Kendall. Tommy, we have no idea what's about to transpire in the next 24 hours, but it's going to be very tough to beat what we saw in this race a year ago. Well, well, there was so much excitement surrounding. It was the 50-year anniversary of the first Rolex 24 last year. It was going to be kind of hard for the race to live up to the hype, but not only did it, it exceeded it. The battle that took place between Alan McNish in the Starworks car and Mike Shank Racing's A.J. Allmendinger in the late stages of that race was truly epic. Yeah, the race last year for us at Starworks was nearly a dream come true. Watching the race unfold last year. I remember thinking, God, we've been here so many times. We've been in this position so many times. What's going to happen this year that's going to take it away from us? That's the only thing. He will make a mistake. Just keep the pressure on. He'll buckle to your pressure. When I heard that, I just laughed. And I, I, I could see he was motivated. And he told me on the radio, after Alan squeezed him really bad in turn one, that we're going to have some issue here. Yeah, it was hard and fast racing here. And, uh, you know, there's obviously the moment on the banking, or the few moments on the banking, when uh, I had a good run on McNish going into one and, and got on the outside of him, and uh, he just basically made sure I was never there again and just kind of ran me off the racetrack. And at that point, that kind of pissed me off a little bit. Dinger and I got a little bit close and had a few discussions uh, as we ran along towards uh, the bus stop chicane. Um, it was just good hard racing. It was a lot of fun. It was, uh, you know, McNish is, is I, I consider, one of the best sports car racers ever. I knew Alan had his, you know, kind of met his match, you know, and AJ was, was more than capable of getting the job done. You know, we were so close to winning it, but you cannot win it until you cross the start finish on first place. So it was, a, it was like a mix of feelings. We were gutted not to win that race, and you know, I, I think I had more emotion on that race, finishing second, or the prospects of winning it, than the year I actually did win it. It's it's freaking hard to get that close, sleep deprivation and all the emotions, and it's still one of those things that's painful, you know, just to this day. You never know if you're gonna get another shot. And... I just knew how hard that Mike Shank and everybody on this race team had worked, how much it meant to everybody, and I didn't want to be the one to let everybody down. 
It's races like the Rolex that make stars, but it's battles like that one that make heroes. And with what happened to A.J. Allmendinger after this race, it makes it all the more poignant. I can hardly wait to see what unfolds. The, the drama of real competition, there's nothing like it. And you heard Peter Barron say you never know when you're going to get another chance, but I'd have to say his Star Works team and the boys over at Michael Shank Racing will be among the favorites for this year's race. As I mentioned earlier, we have no idea what's going to happen in the next 24 hours, so I hope you'll sit back, relax, and enjoy the Rolex 24 with us here on Speed. 15 hours on the network and all night long live streaming at speed.com. The field is on track, so let's go up topside and join our team who will take you to the green flag, Brian Till, Dorsey Schrader, and Calvin Fish. Well, thank you, Bob. You look out of the back of the Audi R8 pace car leading the field around Daytona International Speedway. 761 laps was the winning total last year. Dorsey, you give us just one. Daytona International Speedway is known for its 31-degree banks, and that banking is going to push these guys past 190 miles per hour as they lose that banking and lose their speed, breaking for turn one. Watch for action right there. The slowest corner on the racetrack on the infield and the slipperiest, turn three. It catches a lot of people out. But at every racetrack, there's a real problem area, and at Daytona, it's right here. This chicane, and you'll have a lot of cars crashing there before tomorrow morning. Now let's take a look at Sunoco keys to victory. Be ready. Some teams may have already lost this race by a loose fitting, a damaged gear they didn't find in preparation. Stay in the game. Stay focused. One single mistake can undo your day. And use strategy, the ability to get laps back under the safety car. Keep it fresh. The cruise, the car, the brakes, and that final driver. For sure, it'll be a shootout at the end of this one. And the anticipation is building one pace lap in the books. We're getting closer and closer. You ride on board with Tom Long. One of the many onboard cameras that we will have, the number 70 from Speed Source, the Mazda with Sky Active Diesel Technology, the first diesel to ever run here at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. The weather is absolutely gorgeous today. Very few clouds in the sky. Mid 70s, you couldn't ask for anything better. It should stay this way for 24 hours. And more importantly, and perhaps a little bit of foreshadowing, a full moon tonight, and you know what that brings <laughs> out. Well, it brings out the party, and there's a bunch of that in the infield here. Hopefully, these guys behind the wheel will not be partaking in that. Everyone is ramped up right now. The weather looks really good for the whole duration of this race, so that takes out that element of surprise. So it's all now down to the preparation that has been done and how these drivers execute these 24 hours. And these corners that they're now going through, the GT field and the GX field, they can be crucial. You can get ramped up in that opening lap, Dorsey. There can be problems immediately. But what a performance by these two men. Scott Dixon on the outside pole, Scott Pruitt on the pole for the Telmex Ganassi team. The BMW power looks awfully strong this year. There's been some adjustments, and they have come to the front. They have been very strong. History, perhaps, in the making. Scott Pruitt looking for his fifth overall victory here at the Rolex 24. That would tie him with the legend Curly Haywood, five victories, and we've got a GT car with a problem already out during the pace laps, but for Scott Pruitt, his teammate alongside in the 0-2, Scott Dixon, they will line up. Remember, Daytona prototype separated from the GT field here at the start. Yeah, we should see about a 20-second sec spread between this DP field. There we see one of the uh, GT cars. I think it's one of the Denner Porsches, that Brazilian group that are here with guys such as Tony Canaan and Rubens Barrichello having problems early. It looks like they may have cut down a tire, Dorsey. Yeah, possibly. I heard that tire was locked up for a while, not turning. Could have flat spotted and popped it. I don't know. That could be a brand new brake pad issue. These guys start with really big brake pads at the beginning of these races. I've had that happen before myself. We'll see when it comes around this quarter if it's freed itself. The other thing that happens, some of these drivers will weave the cars yeah, no, around man. to try and get some uh, tire temperature. There may have been a little bit of contact cut down the tire valve, but that wheel is locked up. Yeah, he certainly has tire temperature now. Yeah, <laughs> There's no that's about sure. one half of no it. No tire it pressure, but plenty of tire temperature as we're about to go to green. The 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona about to get underway. The Audi R8 pace car leads the Daytona prototypes to the line. He will dive for pit lane, and we will be racing shortly at Daytona International Speedway. Going green, no passing till start finish. Whoa. You hear him say no green, passing until start finish, but they have split already, and that's something they're not supposed to do. Three wide in the trioval to turn one. Big jump by Scott Pruitt, our pole sitter there. Scott Dixon gets swamped a little bit. The 0-2 is down to the fourth position, followed by Richard Westbrook in the Spirit Daytona car, and here comes the GT star. 
beautiful side-by-side -side start for the GT competitors, much different than that of the Daytona prototypes, and a good start as the GT field streams down to turn one. Scott Dixon just didn't get up to speed, and it really jammed everybody up there. Either there he got caught out by Scott Pruitt, who nailed that start. Pruitt wanting to show that he still has it at 52 years old, but right behind him, Dane Cameron. What a start for Team Salins. The very first time they have run a Rolex Daytona prototype, and they are putting on a show. Cameron qualifies third and is up to second in the early going. Well, you saw Dane Cameron there almost drop the right side off that little curb area as you set up for that area coming back onto the banking the car was twitching a little bit he's pushing hard in the early go and the shank cars are up there in the mix immediately you got to watch dropping wheels here this is florida and it's full of sand and uh you get that sand up on the racetrack and it's good to be really a skating rink by tonight michael valiente there in third he was the leading car of the non-bmw powered cars in qualifying lining up in the fourth spot he wants them to make an impression here today things are settling down meanwhile dan cameron starting to close that gap on scott pruitt Cameron in the red and black team sailing BMW Riley a car almost identical to the zero one out in front the same power plant the same chassis Dane Cameron really showing what he's made of here in the 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona I think what you've seen already that 01 looks like has trimmed out a little bit more he stretched it a little bit on Dane Cameron there goes as he came around the bank he may be running a bit less down for us that's a very good possibility Calvin but also remember that sailors team is quite an accomplishment they came out of JGT there really hasn't much time to test here so I mean this is their first go at it yeah, as Dane said many of these teams have more years of experience than we yeah. have days so it's High learning curve, but what a performance already. Qualifying up there in the top three and running second in the opening hour. That's a good story, no doubt about that. Pushing hard early, and you've got to wonder at one point in time, do you say, all right, let's things settle down and let's start to get to our pace. You see the 0-2 is dropped back at the start. Scott Dixon back to fourth. Chris Nebel. Well, Brian, earlier you said it's a beautiful day. High 70s, track temp right around 95 degrees. Those are some hot temps, tips that these teams haven't seen this entire month of January. Talking to some of these teams, they said, expect the cars to be a little bit looser here in the early afternoon. They're going to have to watch tire degradations. Most of these prototype teams have between 25 and 28 sets of tires left, too. Also, listening to Scott Dixon on the radio after that start, he just said he missed his shift, got up in the rev limiter and missed the shift as they were uh, coming up to speed there. Matt? And Chris, Michael Valiente in the sixth, currently running in the third position. Yesterday during practice, they got very little track time due to a mechanical issue with the clutch. They changed it. There was a lot of concern within the garage. Grand Am officials allowed them to go back out near the end of the day just to run a couple of hardship laps to make sure that they had fixed their issue. All good on the six machine. They're pretty confident about their next 23 and three quarter hours. You know, on that start, all those guys side by side like that, missing a shift is something you don't normally do. He might have just run up on the rev limiter and not been cognizant of the fact that the thing was bang on the rev limiter and just took that little quarter of a second time to get it up in the second or third gear. One of the world's great endurance events, 24 hours around the world center of racing. More from the 51st running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona when we come back right here on Speed. Scott Pruitt, BMW Power lead at Daytona International Speedway. Familiar words, it's been said before. And from the drop of the green, the pole position, Scott Pruitt beginning to pull away a little bit from Dane Cameron and another BMW powered Riley. Yeah, he's got a good pace going. He just dipped into the 141 range on that last lap of 141.8. Cameron and company running 42 zeros and uh, just about that. So Scott's got two or three tenths over the competition right now, but this will change as the balance changes. As we said before, a lot warmer here today, and that'll have an effect, particularly as they get a few more laps on these tires. This is what Scott likes to do, though. He's controlling the race right now by being out front. He's very safe there. He's not running in traffic. He's driving at a very comfortable level, and he's just watching out the rearview mirror. We'll see what's happening endurance pit stop even no i mean it's a, it's a great challenge for us i mean that's how i drag rubens into this i think uh if we're an experience it's been great but like you said i mean this boy's never done a 24 hour race before this cars flew from brazil on the first of the year and they put it together here so uh, it is a big challenge but uh i'm enjoying it a lot i wanted to come back to the 24 hours the only time i did it was in 98 so uh I got tired of watching all of you guys <laughs> in the booth and uh, talking about it, so I want to come and do it. But Tony, when you've hung up your IndyCar helmet, you tell me you'd like to do them off. Sorry? You'd like
like to do Lamar when you've hung up your IndyCar helmet? Well, definitely. I think, uh, you know, that's probably one of the things that are on my list. I already did the 24 hours of Sebring, and we won. Here, we still try to get one, but I would love to go to Le Mans. I mean, uh, it's something that uh, if I have the opportunity, uh, I will definitely do it. Well, tout bon. We hope to see you soon there in Le Mans. Back to you in the booth. Tout bon. Well, Tony's brilliant. I mean, he has such passion for racing. I think that's what this event is all about. Tony's not driving a car that's a favorite for victory, but he wants to be here, and he convinced Rubens Barrichello to be here, and that's what this event is all about. There's boys running for victory. There's boys who just want to experience this Daytona 24-hour race. Well, that's one of the things you have to think about. Yes, you want the watch. Yes, you want the bragging rights, but for season-long competitors, there is a championship at stake, and it starts right here, the very first event of 2013. You ride on board the number three, Stefan Sarazen, behind the wheel of the Corvette. You know, make no mistake about it, though, it's a blast riding around here at Daytona International Speedway. You get up on this bank, you don't get to do this everywhere else in the world. You know, this is a really cool place to have fun at. It's really cool, and speeds down this back stretch here will reach about 185 miles an hour plus, and you're down to second gear here for this chicane, minimum speed about 90. Try not to use too much of that curb. Don't hit the curbs too hard and damage the suspension. Then up through the gears, winding through NASCAR 3 and 4, and then the speeds will get up to about 195 plus, even in the draft. Enzo Potolicchio's brand new Daytona prototype program, the number three, eight-star motorsports. has gone out and formed his own program, and he has brought in some of the best. Anthony Davidson, Stefan Sarazan, who's behind the wheel. Nicholas Manassi and Pedro Lamy. You can't stack the talent much deeper behind the wheel of that Corvette. Right now, a lot of pressure being put on the five from Action Express and the number 10 out of Wayne Taylor Racing Stable, the Velocity Worldwide entry. Max Angelelli behind the wheel. We know how aggressive he can be. He's very aggressive. I'll tell you, he was aggressive after qualifying with his team owner, Wayne Taylor. He was furious. There have been some performance balance adjustments in the offseason. Specifically, all of these Corvettes got a restrictor place on them since the January test, and it really slowed them down. Wayne was furious, and he certainly vented those frustrations to anyone who would listen in the paddock after qualifying. They've got a little bit of the restrictor back. Not what they ran with last year, but somewhere in between. And we'll have to wait and see how that plays out at tw over 24 hours. You, know, you come down to this race every year, guys, and, and you, it's always the same. It always has been the same. All the teams accusing each other of sandbagging. Everybody says nobody's showing their hand. Well, now it's on. I mean, this is the race now. We'll see who's really showing what they had and who didn't. It was a fantastic battle in 2012. Alan McNish may be diminutive in size, but big race shoes on, on that little man, Jamie. He put on a show last year. With endurance sports car racing. Alan, you have multiple wins at Le Mans, at Sebring, at Petit. You've never won overall here at Daytona. What makes this one so challenging? Uh, there's many things. I think the traffic's one big factor, the way the race runs. Uh, it's just never came to me this one. Last year was uh, one of the close ones, but it got away. We won the category the first year, finished second overall. Now that, ah, it's just a matter of time. It's not doing quite that so far. Right now, Everybody's ready to go. Everybody's still awake and alert. What do you do to maintain that for 24 hours? Uh, it's a bit of experience. It's a bit of not sitting out in the sun too long, get back. You know, you've got your job to do in the car. That's when you're in the car. When you're out in the car, that's uh, Ryan at the moment or Alex or it's going to be Seb later on. And so in that side of it, you've just got to, you know, just remember that the checkered flag comes at the end of the race, not after the first hour. Well, experience you certainly have. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Well, remember last year, Brian, that car was really fast. We talked about having a really car, a car that's at 100% at the end of this race. Lucas Lur had an off in that backstop chicane. It damaged the bodywork. That car lost its edge, and I think ultimately may have cost him victory that day. And it doesn't take much. It's just a little splitter that gets damaged or whatever. You lose a mile an hour. You can't stay in the draft anymore. You can't get past. It can literally cost you victory here. And it's what we talked about at the beginning. These guys are driving nearly 10 tenths and trying to do that for 24 hours, and particularly at night. I mean, there's, it's the chances of making it without a problem are very, very slim. Highest placed Corvette Daytona prototype running just outside the top five right now, but a car on the move, the number 30, the burgundy and black Porsche 911, trying to find its way around the SRT Viper there at Sean Edwards. Qualified that car on pole in the GT category, but had an infraction with the rear wing and had to start from the back, and our pole sitter... The 32 with a problem. 
I can't tell yet. That's tire, that's guys. Right there. There. And that's one of the things for these European oh, teams. Yeah. Conrad Motorsports enters this car in conjunction with Orbit Racing over here. But these high banks, if you get too aggressive on your setup with the tire door, see with the camber setup, you can have a problem. But who knows? Maybe he's running into traffic, some kind of issue there. Definitely not with the pole sitter right now. And it's done a lot of damage. Well, and that's the problem when they come apart and they begin to disintegrate. They turn basically oh, into a saw blade. More than tire damage. Yeah. He's been in the wall somewhere. I mean, oh, the yeah. right side's caved in. Look at the wing. That's going to be a massive not repair. Fast, not too fast. It's, <laughs> it's a little late now. <laughs> British driver, the latest Porsche factory driver, as you mentioned, Dorsey, and we believe it was turn six leading up onto the banking, which may have caught him out. That's a strange place to lose it. It's yeah. dead flat down there. For I've sure. crashed there before. I understand yeah. there's some smoke <laughs> coming easy, from the back of the three, the Corvette we uh -oh. were just riding with, Stefan Sarazan, that eight-star motorsport entry, and indeed, you see a little bit of telltale smoke coming out. Looks like just the right side, Dorsey. That could be just blow-by. You know, there's a catch can back there that uh, catches blow-by, but you shouldn't have that much at this time in the race, that's for sure. Here, let's see if we hear it. Sounds okay. It looks more oil leak related than it does engine. Seems to be holding pace there to the car in yeah. front of him, which right now is uh, Ryan Dial. These two guys actually ran together in the World Endurance Championship last year for Enzo Potalicchio, but seems to be holding pace. You know, in a sprint race, you see that in the oil leak, you just ignore it. And when they come and tell you it's leaking, they say, it's just blow by, it's no big deal. But in this endurance, I'd be getting that car in to look at it. 32 has made it to pit road, and Andrew is there. Yes, I am. They're just putting a fresh tire on, and it looked bad to you, but to me, I think it's mainly cosmetic. Uh, I'm just looking on the skin, the uh, rear suspension rings. They all seem straight. I'm looking at the exhaust pipe. That's not damaged. Obviously, there's bodywork damage here, and uh, a lot of damage down the side. Nick Pound is sitting, Nick Pound is sitting there impassively, but he has certainly been in the wall hard. Just look down the side of the car, look at the mirror. Can, Look at the mirror here, completely flattened. So Nick Tandy, though I tell you, he's a fine race car driver, but it looks as if uh, the Daytona walls are bitten him. Now uh, the three car is getting worse, Calvin. It just just about erupted yeah, back there, it looked like. It's on speed, but something big just happened. We'll see if it does it again. See, this is now much more than an oil leak. Well, yeah, oh, but yeah, and he's starting to get a little squirrely there. Yeah, so you'd have it, to think that fluid is getting well, on his rear tires. It, 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 it's, it's a bigger oil leak. It's and, not, and, <laughs> and you well know, oil leaks don't stop no. until yeah, they you run out of oil. Or you run out of oil, or you they're crash. not going to fix themselves. And these are the decisions that have to be made. You're early in this race. We know the safety car procedure. You can get laps back. Do you continue to run this car, potentially no. damage it, or do you bring it in and check it over? No, that's what I was saying before. In a, in a sprint race, you would ignore this, but you do not ignore it in the first, you know, 23 minutes of a 24-hour race. You've got time to fix it now. You come to pit road, you fix it, you take your medicine, you get back out, and you've got plenty of time, like you said, Calvin, to get it sorted out. They need to get the three to pit lane. Well, remember Ganassi last year, they did camber changes, they did gear changes, yeah, they yeah. were hitting the rev limit. You can't afford to run 24 hours with a problem, and that wouldn't last 24 hours, that sort of leak. So bring him in, check it over, and just make sure the car is going to survive. Absolutely. I'd be calling like crazy, but it doesn't look like he's making any effort to get down out of the fast groove. Well, in fact, you would think that the officials might want to bring him in, yes. perhaps putting oil down. I said earlier that the 30 had qualified on pole in GT. It was third. I misspoke there, but they did have to start from the back. So beginning to work their way up to the front. And for Enzo Padalicchio, his eight-star motor work sports team, trying to decide whether to bring the three to pit lane. A long way to go from here at Daytona and the Rolex 24. We'll be back. continues right here on speed see the epic fight to the finish and find out who races their way into the history books don't miss the continued coverage of the rolex 24 at daytona tomorrow 9 a.m eastern live and only on speed stefan sarazan come to pit lane only after being told by the officials to do so jamie what do you see 
Well, I talked to the team before Stefan brought the car in, and they said everything on telemetry looks fine. They don't believe they have an oil leak. They think it might actually be a piece of bodywork or something that's scrubbing the ground. They did take the time to go ahead and put some Sunoco fuel in there. The team hard at work now trying to diagnose what the problem is. There are two Grand Am officials with the eyes also on the situation. It looks like the team might have found something. They went over to grab some tools. I'll keep you updated. Well, some smoke there in yeah. the background as the 32 car to try to get it back on track, but obviously the fix is not suffice. Well, you've got to wonder if with that damage back there, something now has cut down the other tire. Yeah, well, the body work on. hasn't really been fixed to uh, yeah. satisfaction. It's immediately into the tire going to cut it down, so they need to do a better fix than that. But this is a great battle of shaping up between two goes, guys who know was each other very, very well. Dane Cameron now feeling the heat from Michael Valiente. So you got BMW, BMW, Ford, BMW for the top five. <laughs> and Dane Cameron, impressive in his Daytona prototype debut as he works through traffic, going through turn one, Valiente continuing to put the pressure on. And meanwhile, Scott Pruitt beginning to inch away. Still a long way to go, but I'm sure Chip Ganassi enjoying what he's seeing right now, Chris. Yeah, that car has about a six and a half second lead out there, Chip. And your team really the favorite once again this weekend. This early lead, does that build confidence in with the team or does it really matter at all? You know, I think it doesn't mean anything right now, Chris. It's, uh, you know, it's a question of we're getting through traffic a little better than the other guys, it looks like. Look at the lap times, they don't really reflect that type of lead. When I talk to other teams in the paddock, the one common thread I hear is recovery. Your team recovers from mistakes and problems better than anybody else, and to beat you guys, they need to do that. Why does this team recover so well? Well, it's a credit to the guys, you know. Mike Hall and Tim Keene, Barry Wander, Scott Harner, the, the, the group of guys that they put together to run the team, it's, it's all of them. I mean, they're the guys that uh, put the work in to find the people and, uh, you know, bring us down here every year. Well, this is Chip Ganassi's 10th year running the Rolex 24. Well, in the meantime, guys, they pushed the three behind the wall. They have found the problem, which is a gearbox seal. Bad news is you got to take the gearbox off of the engine to fix it. They're going to take it back behind the wall, take it to the garage, and get to work. They've got a lot of time to recover. We've seen it happen before. Dane Cameron, Michael Valiente continuing their good battle. And in GT, it's the Magnus Porsche, Andy Lally, who leads there. And it's good to see that team. They so strong last year. Coming back to run well again. John Potter, who owns that team, has kept a strong lineup behind the wheel of the 44. And they've entered a second car, the 45 from Magnus as well. So that team expanding a little bit. Audi R8 running second. We have not seen that before in the GT category. So Audi really coming on strong here. Audi's here last year, but they just didn't have the pace, but they have been strong throughout testing, practice, and qualifying. Valiente holding on to the back of the red and black 42 right in front. BMW in front, and that blue and white number six, Ford Power. Well, when you look at it right now, when you look at the lap time, the BMW boys are able to run, dip into the 41s, Pruitt, the rest of the guys right there are at the 42-0 mark. Just a couple of tenths behind, you got the Fords, and then the Chevy still seem to be three or four tenths behind the rest of the pack right now. So here we see the second place Audi there, the number 24, driven by DTM driver Felipe Albuquerque. They brought some real stars over here to compete with these Audis, Brian. Well, and you see the leaders now working through the lead of the GT category. It's exactly what you were just saying. It looked like perhaps Dane Cameron and the red and black 42 held up just a little bit. Perhaps Valiente would get a run down at the bus stop. It's not going to happen this time. But Albuquerque doing a great job behind the wheel of that R8, a car he's very familiar with. Yeah, he is, and uh, certainly Audi have come loaded for bear. They had two cars here last year. Now they've got four cars, three of which are really factory supported. A lot of German personnel here this weekend. Director of Audi Sport is Wolfgang Ulrich. He is here on site, and that's really a key indicator to me that Audi want into this GT category in a big way. Here comes Dixon. He gets a run on Valiente, looks to the inside, down into the break zone. He'll take that away easily. Dane Cameron is getting his advantage getting off these corners. See how they catch up to him on the entry to the corner, but Dane is getting power down and is able to gap between corners these other two cars. I don't know if he can do it with Dixon, though. BMW's one, two, three, and it's really a credit to Katie Crawford, the engineer on that 42 machine, that she's mixing it with the big boys here, and she's got a car underneath Dane Cameron that's working well. 
Dane Cameron, young driver, open wheel star, moved to the GT category the last couple of years, really couldn't find a home, did last year at Team Salem in their Mazda RX-8, showed how well he could integrate with that team. Katie Crawford, engineering in the GT category, and now they've kind of come back home, or she has, back into Daytona prototypes, and Dane Cameron taking to this like a duck to water. Dane Cameron, a great run here. Matt Yoakum, what are they saying down at the Team Salem's pit? Very quiet recently, but you know, the headlines all week have been the Ganassi BMWs, and I really think that the 42 especially could be the sleeper in the field. You know, he documented they moved up, they've got BMW power, but they've spent so much time and effort doing small things within the team, whether it be personnel or equipment, just to try to make their package even better from what they've had here in the past. And they've got a, a lot of high expectations, but they feel like they could definitely be a headline stealer before this event's over. Well, and they have stolen plenty of headlines just throughout practice and qualifying. 23 hours and 32 minutes left to go live from Daytona International Speedway. It's the 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona and will bring you plenty of coverage and it's going to be great racing like this, I believe, to the checkered flag. Good battles in Daytona prototype and GT heating up as well. I'll talk about heating up. There you go, class on class battles. Daytona prototypes working their way past the white number 24 from Alex Job Racing, that Audi R8. Another Audi right in the mix there too, Renee Rast. He switched from the Magnus Racing Team. He won this event last year, but he's now in the 52 Audi, so they're running two and three. Andy Lally continues to lead in the defending championship car, defending champion car here at the 24. That's the 44 Magnum entry. Pass for position between the Audi boys. They're not team, they're not on the same team, they're behind the same manufacturer. Well, they get their paycheck from the same place. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you want to pass gently. <laughs> Audi really pulling out all the stops. They want to make an impression on GT racing here in the Rolex Sports Car Series. And Brad Kettler and his crew really doing a great job helping these three teams learn how to work with this Audi R8. They brought factory Audi drivers over. All three of the cars that the factory has helped support here has three factory drivers and an American driver in them, and they have been impressive. They really have. Rene Rast, for example, he's a three-time Porsche Cup champion. He won in an R8 at Spa, the 24-hour race last year. So tremendous experience as he moved that APR car up into the second Spa. See the number nine from Action Express, and you give it an idea of how the speed differential works out between Daytona prototypes and the GT cars, as you see the 52 onto the back straightaway. There's the 73, one of the entries from Park Place Motorsports. You understand that he had dropped back a bit. He had had a good qualifying run, but really something happened on this last lap. Dropping well back, Patrick Long behind the wheel. Yeah, they were running up in the second spot. They're behind Lally, then the Audis went by them. I'm not sure if he's uh, had a problem, some kind of temperature issue he may be hearing on the radio. So maybe he's just backed off the pace to see if that will settle down with him making a pit stop. But Pat Long is really impressed. Patrick, the radio communication there. He's been really impressed with this new team. Oh, oh and he runs off. Probably just a bit distracted, probably trying to look at gauges, seeing what's going on with the engine temp, and just runs afoul of that chicane. More than likely, he'll come in. It's early in the race. No need to keep a hot engine hot. You know, you're going to end up doing damage. Get it back in, find if you've got a hole in the radiator, what serious problem you might have. Porsche side by side. That's the 80 of True Speed Motorsports up above Patrick Long. That's a 3.8 liter versus 4 liter. They can run different engines in the Porsches in GT. A lot of stories yet to talk about from Daytona International Speedway and the 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona. We'll be back with more right after this. Just over a half hour into the 24 hours of hard racing that make up the Rolex 24 at Daytona live here on Speed.
Very early in the race, and already we've seen plenty of the kind of heartache you find in a 24-hour event, some of it due to contact, some of it due to mechanical issues. I'm Bob Varsh in our infield speed studio with Justin Bell and Tommy Kendall. Thoughts on the race thus far, Justin? Well, you know, I was just thinking about it when we were watching the immediate attrition at the beginning of this race. I was walking through the paddock just before all the mechanics and drivers are staring at their cars going, we've done all the work we can do. It's as good as it's going to be. And yet, you know, don't you, as a driver, Tommy, something on this car, it could be a $10 part, could let us down. And we've already seen that. First time I came here watching my dad race, he finished second his first ever times. Next year, he came back, sat on the pole and was out on the first lap. It can happen. And... The attrition I'm seeing, you know, you've got a factory Porsche guy having a pretty big off. Uh, we just saw the the uh, 42 car slip up. These guys are really running hard. There's no such thing as a pace anymore. And so I, I get the feeling that this one, we're going to have maybe an unusual number of uh, difficulties. Looking at the number 50 car in the pits. Not sure exactly what's going on. Ian James behind the wheel. Very experienced lineup. Former overall winner Jim Pace. Carlos de Quesada has won in the GT class before. It's a group of good old boys, you might say, having fun at the racetrack to raise money for the Alzheimer's Foundation. Now the car being hauled away. Andrew Marriott, what's going on? Yeah, they've got a problem in the engine department now. I know Ian was really pumped up about this race. I spoke to him earlier, and he was very happy with that car. But uh, they've got a... And the, and the car is uh, stuck in fifth gear, in fact. And they just can't fix it at the back. So... Uh, that car is going back behind the wall, so that's the second car that's got the gearbox to make the problem already. Gearboxes do seem to be a bit of an athlete's here of these uh, DP cars. Problems on the racetrack for A.J. Allmendinger and the defending race champion Michael Shank Racing. You just saw whatever the problem was, he got pinned up against the wall a bit with the, the faster traffic coming underneath, so it must have taken him a bit by surprise. Uh, but he's in the right spot now, and that's, that's quite a long way back down to the pit lane entrance. And you can see he's trying to stay as low as he can. He's got a long ways to go. This is NASCAR turn two. He's got to go through the bus stop. Okay, he, we're being told he has a flat, and what he's trying to do is uh, avoid what happened to the Tandy car, where when the tire comes apart, it basically turns into like a weed whacker or a saw blade, like Brian Till said. Mm -hmm. See some big lockup. Oh, big lockup. Guys up trying there. to get around him. Looks like the right. The driver's left front might be up, so thinking if there's a tire down, it might be the right rear. Another early problem for a contending car here at this, year's, this year's Rolex 24. Yeah, we've seen, haven't we, earlier talking about the telemetry uh, with the gearbox issue on one of the cars earlier. You know, the telemetry says everything's fine, but the driver knows it isn't, and everyone watching knows this is pretty obvious right now. There's Michael Shank, the team owner, with his hand on his headset in the dark shirt. This is basically an unchanged lineup from the one that won last year. As you see a lot of grass there. Looks like he's been off track. A lot of grass across the radiator screen. Let's get more from Matt Yoakum in the pits. And Michael Shanks just told A.J. Allman the front of the car looks fine. A.J. thought he might have had actually a flat left front. Now they're going to bring the car in and take a look and see if something is broken in the front of the race car. He's trying to take his time to get back here as quick as possible, as you mentioned, because he thought he might have had a tire going down, but they're telling him it looks like that all the tires are up. Yeah, now that we can see the right side of the car, I'd agree. But that front radiator can give you a spike in temperatures and maybe he's seeing that but the team aren't reporting it apparently top four names you see there Almendinger, Pugh, Negri and added this year Marcos Ambrose Oz Negri was training in the offseason had a fall off his mountain bike and hurt his right leg quite badly he wasn't able to test with the team at the beginning of January they brought in Marcos Ambrose who puts his hand in the air and says I'm just here to help I'm not going to try any heroics Oz Negri has been cleared to drive the car, but they don't know how perhaps the fastest guy on that team, how long he'll be able to go behind the wheel. Now the double zero car, one of the cars in the new GX class. This is the Mazda 6 with Skyline diesel technology. Back to the 60 car. 
While we try to sort it out, let's get the views of the guys up in the booth, Calvin, Dorsey, and Brian. Well, guys, what happened right there is the tie rod is broken on that left front suspension. That's the upper link right here. In fact, now the driver's going to go, I mean, the mechanic's going to show you. It's broken to the inside, and they're going to have to repair that heim joint. He must have capped something with that wheel, and uh, it's definitely broken to the inside. Yeah, as he came to a stop, Dorsey, the left front wheel was suddenly askew and outside of the bodywork. So AJ had felt something initially, thought maybe a flat tire, but he did the right thing. He slowed it way down, didn't risk throwing it off the road and doing further damage. You can recover from something like this, as we said. However many laps you go down, you need a subsequent number of yellows to get back in the game. The year one is in, thinking there'll probably be a yellow. And this is what it's all about, making those calls, being proactive. The 0-0 zero zero is stalled on the racetrack. They're expecting a yellow. What do you think, Chris? Well, Scott Pruitt gets stay behind the wheel. Going to do four fresh tires on this stop. Fuel, listening to Scott Pruitt during this run, he said the car is a little bit tight on entry, but really good coming off the corner. Interesting to hear as this is a hot track. And you can see the team really taking their time, blowing out the radiator. Also, the five car in pit lane, Christian Fittipaldi, has been on the radio during this event saying that the water temp was high in the car. They had some debris on the nose of the car, so they're going to blow that out. They're probably also going to add some water. They weren't sure if they pushed any water out, so they've got to check that out. Yeah, we got a big piece of debris right here on the road, uh, right here on the radiator front. You can close it off about a half of that radiator opening. So they were getting temps about 100, 230 degrees or so, and uh, the crew has pulled that out. So everything should be pretty good with this car now that they clean that out. That stop taking a little longer than they Fire wanted it, it to. You saw yeah, yeah, the, jacks, the jacks collapse and the car fell back down to the ground. They had to get it back up so they could get that tire change done. And those are the types of mistakes that can cost you. GT pit stops now taking place on board the number 24 Audi, second place in GT. This team led by Alex Job Racing. He's had so much success here over the years. Just one of the most successful sports car teams in existence. And talking to the group, it's almost like you think of Yost and Audi at Le Mans. That's essentially what these teams are doing here. Like Alex Job is really providing logistics and some staff as well to get these cars campaigned here at this Daytona 24-hour race. It's a combination of the German engineering squad coming over from Germany, obviously, and then some of Alex's crew to really form the best team possible. And you see the rum bomb Audi right behind there. It stopped right behind the 24. The 02 is in, as is the 69 from AIM. The AIM FXDD Ferrari, very familiar if you're a Rolex Sports Car Series fan. Watch that car. Jeff Siegel and Mia Lasitato win the GT Championship last year. 02 is in. Dixon had a strong run up to second. What are you seeing down there, Chris? Yeah, pretty much the same act that we saw with the 01 car, the team taking time to blow those radiators out. That's one thing that this year is because last year that Gen 3 car was so new, they didn't have a notebook. They were really just getting the cars put together. This year, they are really well prepared. They've got a lot of data on the car, and they spent a lot of time looking at the radiators and making sure that they had the proper cooling for these cars for the 24 hours because that's the one thing we see every year tomorrow afternoon is those radiators have taken a beating. 42 minutes into this event. A lot of these teams, as you said, Calvin, you're getting close to that first stint anyway. And with the problem for the double zero, which is the Mazda GX, you see it stalled there on the racetrack. A lot of teams thinking that perhaps we would go full course caution. So as they work to get the Mazda back in, teams beginning to play their strategy. And you talk about problems. They've happened early for the defending race champions, Mike Shake racing in the 60. Mechanics going to work, and we'll be back to Daytona for more of the Rolex 24. Not a good day for the Double Zero. Visit Florida Racing Speed Source Yellow Dragon Motorsports. That's a mouthful. Mazda 6. <laughs> Another one of the Sky Active diesels with a problem. And they have removed him without having to go full, full course caution. And that is good news for the competitors. The 44 Magnus Racing just leaving after making their pit stops. And uh, we're just about to the end of the stints anyway. We understand during the pit stops, the 99 Gainsco Daytona prototype and the 94 from Turner Motorsports speeding on pit lane. They will have to come back. A new pit lane speed system this year. And some of the teams we saw struggle getting a handle on it in the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge race yesterday seems to have uh, bled over into today.
Well, it's kind of complicated to explain, but essentially there are timing lines spread up and down pit lane, so there's like a segment, and they time your average speed over that segment. And what some of the teams have figured out, you can actually accelerate into your pit box. Because you're coming to a complete stop, your average speed will then be low for that segment, and you won't get caught out. So but I think they're rolling, uh, playing with fire when they're doing this, Dorsey, because it's a big penalty if you do get caught. We're taking a look at the rum bump entry. If you're a Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge fan, you know how strongly they run there. And now, good to see them with an Audi R8 in a Rolex GT. One of the factory drivers running with them this weekend is no stranger to endurance racing, Andrew. No, he's won them all five times, Frankie Vila. Frankie, there's life after prototypes. Um, yes, of course, it's something different, but uh, I really enjoyed it. It's the first time at Daytona now. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it, and uh, I've been nervous for my first stint. And uh, looking around the team, it's, it's got all the Audi trademarks here, all the professionalism, all the attention to details. Definitely. We really tried to uh, enter this one uh, really in a good way and in a professional way, so everything is uh, well prepared. The guys are doing a good job, and uh, we just have to try to get into a rhythm now. The first uh, pit stop now was very good. Tires are looking good. Guys did a good job, so uh, it's a long way to go, and uh, I think now, first evening, try to find a rhythm, get everything working, and then we'll see. Great to see you still racing. To you, Chris Neville. Well, Andrew, this is the 61 Ferrari in the garage. This is one of our favorites in the GT class. Jeff Siegel behind the wheel, Max Pappas, Giancarlo Fisichella, and Tony Vlander, his co-drivers this weekend. This is the second time this car has been in the garage. Jeff said on the radio about 10 minutes ago that he wasn't able to shift the car, so an electronic problem in the car. They came to the garage initially, hooked laptops up to the car, thought they had it taken care of. However, exiting the garage, trying to get back out on track once again, he didn't have proper shifting, so it's back in here it looks like engineers are trying to button things up they've uh, had laptops hooked up to this ferrari and now i can see jeff trying to go through some shifting uh shifting sequences on the wheel as the car alarm, is uh, in control, the garage you're trying to see problem. if they've got any drive before they let him out of the garage matt and over in the michael shanks racing they are still working on the 60th aj allmendinger on that tie rod, the, the six, their teammate, he came in, Sunoco fuel and tires, and he was away. No changes on that machine at Valiente. Still trying to blow out all the grass in the nose section of the 60. They're also going to have to replace the mirror on the left side. AJ passed that information on when he was bringing the car to pit lane, but still, work continues. Well, you have to wonder if that mirror was damaged on the left side. Maybe he got into it with some traffic doors. He maybe clouded that left front wheel as well. Look at here, guys. Kevin Doran's car, the 77, in the lead of this race. Something we're glad to see. And that is impressive stuff for young Colin Brown and for the entire team. Kevin Doran taking his Doran chassis, which eventually became a Delara, and they have put Riley Gen 3 bodywork on it. It's kind of Frankenstein, but it has been running well all weekend long. At the Roar, they tested with the old bodywork. It's brand new this weekend. It's Frankenstein, but the car is awfully pretty and is very effective. These guys are stretching their mileage a little bit further than some of the other DP competitors. And uh, Colin Brown, John Bennett, who run regularly together in the ALMS series in the PC class, but um, joined by Paul Tracy. Jim Lau's a good effort here this weekend. We saw the 50 have problems earlier. Chris, what seems to be the problem there? It's busy down in the garage down here, Brian. Just saw the 61 car pull out, so hopefully they've got the gear situation sorted out over there. Also, right behind me, the uh, 50 car over here. Ian James was behind the wheel at the beginning of the race. Ian, what's going on with this car? Yeah, unfortunately, got stuck in 50 gear, which really, you know, for the Alzheimer's Association, we're raising money, we're trying to do laps here. So they got a new gearbox casing going back on. We'll be out in 10 minutes. Okay, seeing the crew back, working back there, you said they're putting an entire new gearbox in the car, or just a new gear cluster? Just a new stack of gears in the back casing. Okay, interesting. They're going to put a new gear cluster in there that typically a change like that takes about two minutes. But the one thing is, is if there's any debris in that gearbox, they need to make sure that they get all that debris out because that's the last thing you want. 23 hours to go and some of that debris, are debris breaking up this next cluster of gears that they're putting in. 60 leaving pit lane. Dorsey, all these gearbox problems. Nice to have that paddle shift. It's great when it works, but it kind of makes you wish for the old Hewlin H pattern box, doesn't it? Well, we're having a lot of gearbox problems. We've got a lot of mechanical problems. People in the garage, as Tommy Kendall said, he predicted that we might have a lot of this going on. Well, I'll tell you what, that 61, yeah, yeah, he's got some shifting right. issues. He can't get up through the gears, and AJ's trying to get around and get back on the program. He's lost seven laps, seven laps. Now, you may think that is a hole you cannot dig your way out of, but with 
every yellow, there is the ability to gain one lap back on the field. A couple of years ago, the SunTrust team, which is now the Velocity Worldwide team, the number 10 team led by Wayne Taylor, made up nine laps in one of these 24-hour events. You just got to keep digging. Well, we talked to Tony Kanan earlier about running here at the Rolex 24 and his team partnering with Rubens Barrichello and the rest of his Brazilian friends. Unfortunately, the 21 running third at one point in GT. Long, long stop on pit lane. The crew not happy. Finally back underway, but that cost them precious time. Right, you know why it was a long stop in pit lane? Nobody working on it. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of unusual. I didn't see anybody do anything. 77 that was it's leading hot. is coming in here. It's hot as uh, through the overflow there. Dorsey is pushing some water out of the water system. That's kind of what I saw in the double zero Mazda that broke down out there. Andrew, what was the story with the 21? Well, that's Tony Canal was telling us early. These boys have never done an endurance pit stop before. And I've got to tell you something. They need a bit more practice. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a lot of it. There was a lot of Brazilian emotion and some uh, rather rude Portuguese words. And there was uh, slamming and people pushing each other around. And uh, obviously they're, they're learning these boys. But uh, that car's actually running quite well at the moment, the 21. No signs of Rubens, by the way. I am told he is still back in his motorhome somewhere. And I guess he'll grace us with his presence a bit later. But, you know, he's a Formula One star after all. You may want to tell him, Andrew, they need to be on the other side of the pit wall. <laughs> Well, the they've, they've got 23 hours more to <laughs> practice them, so maybe by the time they get to the end, they'll be good at it. <laughs> Brendan Hartley took over the point momentarily in the number eight. Now Scott Pruitt being shown back up there as we cycle through the pit stops. And now the eight on to pit road. Chris? Well, Brian, still working my way through the garage. The three car in the garage here trying to get that car sorted out. We can see the entire back end of the car. This is the back end that started the race. They had a differential failure in this car, so they just changed out. Gearbox, suspension, exhaust, put a new set in the car. All those parts are ready. First hour of this race, about $125,000. And that's what I was talking about, those crash carts. At the beginning of the show, I said, behind the garage, you'll have everything that you own back there to fix whatever happens during this 24-hour race. Cruise. The work will take its toll on them by the time we get to the end of 24 hours, and they are already working hard on many of the teams trying to effect repairs and get back to the battle for the Rolex chronograph that will be handed out at the end of this event. More from Rolex 24 at Daytona coming your way on speed. It's always a special time of year for every motorsports enthusiast. February Speed Week's underway with the Rolex 24. So many legendary heroes have competed here at Daytona and won, including what many consider probably the greatest of all time to climb behind the wheel of a race car, the legend Super Tex, A.J. Foyt. You were supposed to be the Grand Marshal here a year ago, but a little illness kept you away, but you're back this year. You've got your gold watch for being the Grand Marshal. So many great memories here, AJ. Well, yes, I was supposed to be here, and I was always trying to fulfill my promises, and Rolex, I told you, if I wasn't in the hospital this next year, I'd be here, so that's one the reason I'm here today, to fulfill my promises, and it's terrible. I feel a lot better here today than I was last year in the hospital at this time. The only man to win the Indianapolis 500, Daytona 500, the 24-hour Le Mans, and right here, the 24 hours of Daytona, the Rolex 24. Your two wins here, though, my greatest memory was when you drove in the rain in your first win. Well, that's quite true, yeah. I've had some pretty good luck down here in Daytona. I just got to get my friend Tony to have some luck down here. I keep telling him he sent me a championship ring that he won, and I said, well, I keep looking on that board and won a trophy, Tony. I haven't seen your name, but... Uh, I think he's due to win. What was it like coming in here, not winning only once, but winning twice? Oh, it was great, you know, it almost was three times. My good friend George Snyder fueled for me for 24 hours about 15 minutes ago. It just completely quit or we could have won it three times. But uh, it was great to win it the first time here because my father was past almost dying and France and him called me to come here. And my daddy said, you don't have to do this weekend, get out of here. So I come down here and then be lucky enough to take the trophy back home to him. I was very proud. Since retiring, you've had so many drivers in your race cars. You also had a guy named Brian Till. You remember him behind the wheel of one of your cars? Quite well. Brian did a good job for me. He's a super guy, and uh, I just guess he kind of give it up, Brian did. <laughs> and, uh, I think if he had stayed with it, he could have went a lot further. Well, AJ, always an honor and a pleasure. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt. Nice being here with you. Guys, uh, at least he was nice to me. Wow. <laughs> That's better than Jack Roush did yeah, to me. Yeah, you yeah. immediately broke into a sweat. Yeah, I, I started sweating immediately. You're right, Calvin. Oh, boy. All right. Scott Pruitt continuing the lead here on board. The 43, the second team sailing entry. Bruno Giancara behind the wheel, back into 13th. Let's take a look. Oh, dear. Ooh. Well, he went for a ride there, like something broke. It's like it didn't even turn. Yeah, yeah that's the fastest. That's the fastest corner on the infield. That was the entrance to the kink, and that's pretty frightening to have something break there. Yeah, tire is up, so it has to be something more severe, but I just went straight. You, you would al almost expect a, a steering type issue like we saw on yeah. the 60 car. The car never attempted to turn, and and that is, you know, that's very nearly on good tires. It's flat out. I mean, it's a very scary kink in the infield. They call it dog leg. I've spun there one time, and I, I said never again. <laughs> that was pretty scary. Bruno Juncara may pull double duty. He may jump over to the 42 car. And the rules are if you compete in two cars in the same class, you have to qualify and start one of them, which he did with the 42 car. Dave Cameron, Wayne Nonamaker, and Simon Pagino may need help to get through this 24 hour race, and Bruno is ready to do it. Right on board, the number 30, the NGT entry. Sean Edwards behind the wheel, up to 10th in GT after having to start last because of that rear wing infraction. The rear wing just millimeters past the plane where it could be towards the rear. It doesn't matter how much it is, it is. So they have to start at the back and he is on a tear. These rules are, when it comes to that sort of thing, are black and white. You either conform or you get sent to the back, which is what the case was this time. Pretty cool to see the Momo colors being campaigned here again at Daytona. I don't think anyone will forget their success over the years here. The one here in 98 was Ian Pierre and Moretti. Pretty cool stuff. And the interesting thing about this team, the last race they ran was Petit Le Mans last year in the GTC category, and they won it, so that's a pretty good momentum to carry you over the winter. It'll be interesting to see if they can find a victory here at the Rolex 24. Good, good look right here at the draft, in fact. You can see that car gets pulled right on up to back to 23. Remember, you're on this banking for pretty much half of the lap, and so it uh, really makes a big difference. The difficulty is, Dorsey, is choosing your gearing correctly because if you gear for the draft where you're going to reach a higher speed and need a higher top gear, when you're by yourselves, it may not want to pull it. So you can't afford to over the engine unless you're just going to feather the throttle a little bit. And if the wind changes, we saw it last year with the Ganassi team, one of the best in the business, made a mistake in their gear choice at the beginning, but decided to correct it early. You can see the effect on the wind of the wind on the 23 car right in front of you there, the WeatherTech car, as the buffeting from this car, the Momo car, started shaking the rear bumper cover on that car violently, and that's what it feels like in the car as well. When that draft comes up and catches you, it starts buffeting the rear window. You know something big's going on from behind. And it is so interesting. It can be as something as simple as you look out the back of the number 23, Alex Joe Porsche. The wind changes direction, as you said, Calvin, and all of a sudden your gear is not tall enough. You're on the rev limiter at the start finish line, and you cannot make the pass down into turn one. So as things change, it can affect the way you race. Well, we saw, we saw Timmy Keene from Ganassi last year call Scott Pruitt's car in because it was banging the rev limiter, just like what you're talking about. It picked up a rear tailwind and started hitting too much, so he came in and changed the gear. Very smart move. On board there, we could see Jerome Blinkemuller behind the wheel of the Alex Joe Bracing Porsche. None of those drivers, very impressive driver lineup, but none of them had the Daytona win. And uh, Alex likes that. He said it's extra motivation, but what a team that is. 67 sports car wins over the years since 1995. 48 poles, 106 podiums. They get the job done. But well, we talked about preparation as you see the 0-1 out in front. Scott Bruitt, Ganassi, some of the best in the business in preparation, Chris. Yeah, Brian, great at preparation. We also talked to uh, Chip Ganassi about recovery, and this is where it all happens right here in the Ganassi garage. Each year I take a walk through this garage, and I'm always amazed at everything that they bring. We see stacks of brake rotors and calipers. When they do those changes, they do the entire corner. They do the rotor, the caliper, and the brake pad. Quick disconnects. Each of these, about $2,500 worth of equipment. We saw in the three car them changing the back end of the car. That's what's underneath this canvas right here. We see stacks of rotors that they potentially are going to need to 
used throughout this race. They've got uh, all kinds of spindles. They've got, uh, we've got axles over here ready to go. And then on the other side of this cabinet, they've got boxes of all different types of stuff that need to be fixed or replaced on these cars. And they not only have the spare parts, they have the tools they need to fix that specific thing inside these boxes. So if something happens, it's essentially an emergency crash cart ready to go down here. Hey, Dorsey, quick question for you. You kind of know all these parts down here. What's this little motor? Can't quite see what that thing is yet. That, uh, that's a nice little motor. Could be power steering. It's an EPS motor. It says so right on the, uh, on the, the back. That's an EPS motor. <laughs> that's power there you steering. go, guys. You guys know what you're talking about. Plenty more to come from the World Center of Racing. The 51st Rolex 24 at Daytona continues. Scott Pruitt out in front. BMW Power leading the way from right here at Daytona International Speedway. NAS NASCAR is back and the Motorsports Authority is the destination for Speed Week's biggest events with ARCA, the Duel at Daytona, and the Camping World Truck Series. Then, before the Great American Race, get the ultimate setup with NASCAR Race Day, fueled by Sunoco. Speed Week's from Daytona kicks off February 14th live on Speed. Your ride on board. See just how busy it is. That's the 67, the Porsche entry from the racers group. I think you call him Duda, but his real name is Dumont <laughs> Dumont. <laughs> Former Le Mans winner, one of the best in the business, and he just drugs the wheels off everything he gets in. Fierce competitor. You can see that. You can see the language. He is going for it. Sharing this car with Nick Janssen, Tracy Crone, and Emmanuel Pollard. Tracy Crone so wants a podium here at Daytona. He's done it before at Le Mans, of course, but he has been outside. A couple of fourth place finishes in the DP ranks. There you see the familiar Crone racing colors. You know, and, and these guys, guys like Romain Dumas, see, I said it, I didn't call him Duda that time, and Frank Bila earlier. Think about the professionals that they are, the races that they've won, and how different the cars are that they're driving here from the prototypes that they drive at Le Mans. They've got the skill and the ability to bounce back and forth from that high-tech, high-downforce prototype to a much more simplistic, shall we say, GT entry. Well, I think for Dumas and these boys, it's like putting on an old pair of shoes, Dorsey. I mean, they're just so comfortable and just know the limits. The, the Porsches are a little bit different to drive. I'd have to say like an Audi or the Ferrari are more what I call a normal balance to a race car. It's a real art in determining how you drive one of these Porsches fast, and they've been doing it year in, year out. You like Dorsey getting back in a Whistler or Mustang? I take a few laps. <laughs> 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 On board the number 90 Spirit of Daytona, another one of the Corvette Daytona prototypes in the category. Richard Westbrook behind the wheel, and Westbrook trying to get to the finish line as soon as he can. Of course, that's a 24-hour race, but he's got a something he wants to get home to. Yeah, his wife, Jess. <laughs> He's expecting their first child, and it was due about 10 days ago, and he's <laughs> running out of time fast. They may hang on till Monday. He's calling his missus every opportunity, but boy, what a dilemma. First race of a championship season, the biggest <laughs> race of the year, and he was back home in, in England. Good one luck thing to Jess. Of, one thing about it, I don't care how fast he drives, it's still going to take him 24 hours. Take 24 hours. <laughs> That's That's right. Right. He was concerned that any time the radio crackled that they were going to tell him to pit for anything else, it might be called home when you get out of the car, but... Uh, you know, think about the focus that he has to have. He's got to focus on the job at hand, and obviously that is a life-changing experience. As you well know, Calvin, you just had your first child back in November, and you know what a life-changing experience that is. I know you get up to feed the baby a lot in the middle of the night. Yes, I do. I'm there in full support of <laughs> my wife. I know she's done a brilliant job with our young daughter, Olivia, but, Olivia, but it's uh, certainly a great time, but for Westy, it's a lot of pressure on him here this weekend, but he's focused, he's getting the job done. Now, remember before when we were looking at this car and I said the rear bumper was from the uh, draft getting pushed around? Well, it, it broke. <laughs> I guess I see what it was. Jerome Bligamolin behind the wheel of the 23 from Alex Joke Racing. Bligamolin, spectacular in this type of car. Let's see if we can see what happens. Oh, watch this. I think I know what might happen. You think about, you think wind isn't doing a lot to those cars going down here at 190 mile an hour? I mean, it just ripped that bumper cover completely off. You can see it flapping. I saw it before, and I thought it was just, you know, it's the draft from the other car pushing up on me. Blake Mullen has already won a 24-hour race this year. Actually, a couple of the drivers in the field 
have done so. They run the 24 hours of Dubai. He and Sean Edwards shared the car there, and Shane Lewis in the GX category also won in class. So uh, these guys are already a very busy 2013. At least it's bent back to the back part of the car where it's not a big air parachute. You know, it's doing a little damage, though. You gotta feel like the officials might wanna bring that car in just to make sure we don't get debris on the racetrack. Good to see the 60 back on track, but they are well down in the order, Matt. Brian, about 25 minutes before we're gonna make a driver change and AJ Stitt will end and Oz Negre will get in, but a broken fibula in your foot. The cast came off less than a week ago. Yesterday, you practiced getting in and out of the race car simulating a driver change. What was the discomfort that you were feeling? Well, I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, thin legs, so uh, coming in and out of the car wasn't a problem. Uh, when I'm driving, I, I actually don't feel it because I'm concentrated and uh, focused on, on what I'm doing on track. But as soon as I come out of the car, it reminds me that I, that I still have a broken piece in there. E expectations of how long we're going to run? Um, we don't know. I will do. I'll definitely do one uh, one stint. Uh, uh, depending how it goes, uh, I'll, I'll do some more. I'm, I'll do whatever the team needs me to do. But we are thinking a, a long term here. We we've, we've got the whole uh, championship ahead of us, and uh, we don't want to make this any worse. All right. The one thing about it is, as you talked about throughout the weekend, Dorsey. Uh, he is a right foot breaker, so he's had to change up his entire routine of how he breaks that machine. And, and also, there was a scuff mark on the left front corner of the 60 machine. Actually, as you can see, his brace. Michael Shanks told me basically that took place after the tie rod broke and AJ scuffed the wall. So that's what they believe, how they got the bodywork damage on that left front corner. Well, you know, you might think it's easy just to change from right foot brake to left foot brake, but when you're braking at 100% efficiency, at right threshold braking, and you do that with your right foot, the sensitivity of your right foot is what dictates what makes you feel it. Your left foot, all of a sudden, you switch over the other way, and there's a coordination then from releasing that brake pedal, going to the throttle with the other foot, and you can get the timing wrong. And remember, that leg is still broken, so there is some pain there. No doubt about it. Surprised they didn't actually put it Oz in when the car was being repaired because he's not going to get in real quick either. Getting out is one thing, getting in. So there's several laps down. Get him in, get him his 30 minutes of drive time so he scores championship points this year in the first round of the championship. But good that Matt clarified the situation with AJ Allmendinger. Seems like the tie rod broke. That put him up in the wall. And that's what broke the mirror off rather in contact with another race car. Allmendinger turning good laps as he's gotten back on track, but still. No one can chase down Scott Pruitt as he continues to lead here from Daytona and his teammate Scott Dixon right behind. We'll be back to more from Daytona International Speedway and the Rolex 24. Welcome back to Daytona and earlier this week myself and a bunch of the competitors here in this race had an opportunity to visit Camp Boggy Creek. It's located in central Florida down in Eustis about 50 minute drive from here in Daytona and there we see we had a lot of fun that day played some golf played some archery down low on the archery it's a very tight competition in golf I took advice from that man young Jordan Taylor which steered me in the wrong direction <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did get involved in a putt off which turned into uh, shooting the bow and arrow which I've never done before so as you can tell I wouldn't have done very well at that but it's a it's a wonderful place it's touched a lot of hearts and it's really uh, dedicated to a lot of children have uh, life-threatening or chronic illnesses and I believe we've had 57,000 children go through the camp now and it's just a wonderful place led by Sarah Gittes. It's a very special place and I, I think about you and a bow and arrow kind of just made me think of Robin Hood <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. They said putt off and then they handed me a bow and arrow. I was like, what is this all about? <laughs> There's a look at the 99 from Gainesco, Alex Gurney behind the wheel. Running 10th right now, just one of the Corvettes that's entered in the field. Another is the number 10 from Velocity Worldwide, Chris. Yeah, down here with Wayne Taylor. He's watching time and score. He's watching the telemetry coming off his car. And Wayne, the Corvettes were given a restrictor change after qualifying yesterday. And with that restrictor change, did you guys pick up any top end? Does that change the setup or any of the gearing with the car? No, you know, clearly we are very, very down on power. And like I said, you know, they're a second a lap at minimum quicker than us. So a second a lap over 24 hours is six laps. And if you look at this grid now, they are 43 laps and they're 41 seconds ahead. Um, 
We've trimmed the, the car out that it is really tough in the infield. The only way we can, you know, stay in contention. So all we can do is um, get everything right in the pit lane and the drivers and execute and see what see what we get later on. Now you've won this race twice and you know it's not always the fastest car out there that wins, but what do you need to do within the team to try and make some changes or keep everybody's spirits up? Well, we got the best team, the best guys and the best, um, best drivers. And everybody, everybody's really excited about this. And at the end of the day, we probably, we also racing to win the Corvette race because that's what all we can do right now. Um, but, but having such a, an advantage, it's very, very hard to race against that kind of competition. On a lighter note, you always enjoy watching your sons out there racing, but your sons also produced a music video a couple weeks ago. After you saw that video, what were your thoughts? I don't know if I know them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, Wayne's talking about trying to get a good finish here. They've got to really think about that championship, too. And, guys, it looks like we are got a full course caution for uh, the double zero car. Uh, part of the music video that probably shouldn't really... I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but still, the double zero off... The same car that we had off earlier that uh, brought us our first round of pit stops, the Mazda. This is the diesel Sky Active. And once again, it's smoking from in front of that windshield it looked like it was pushing some steam out before you know reminiscent of overheating i don't know irony is spencer pickett who's driving the car or sharing the car this weekend was part of that video he was yeah. always <laughs> having his leg stretch there on the on the land and the boys had a lot of fun and this is a car that's competing in this new gx class which is really open to gt style cars that do not really fit the gt regulations and it really opens the door for new technology such as this sky active diesel and i think there's a cross that will continue to grow spencer pickett 19 years old he'll have plenty of more opportunities to try to win the watch at the rolex 24 one of the future stars of racing here in america the problems they've befallen them here at the rolex 24 we'll be back for more right after this Here's your chance to climb behind the wheel with some of your favorite Grand Am drivers for the ultimate two-screen experience. Enhance your Rolex 24 live coverage with Speed Onboard Pass. Go to speed.com now to view the live stream, chat with fellow race fans, and view exclusive photos. The first full course caution of the day here at the 51st Rolex 24, and the leaders are on pit road. Chris? Yeah, Scott Pruitt being reminded by his team to stop short in the box here because his teammate Scott Dixon pulling right in front of him. Want to make sure Scott Pruitt can try and get out of here in the 01 car. Going to do fuel, tires, fuel on the 01. Scott Pruitt staying behind the wheel. On the 02 car, going to put Dario Frentini behind the wheel. Both of these cars a little bit tight on entry, but these crew chiefs saying they're making no adjustments now because they think with the cooler temperatures, the cars will be set up great. Also, these teams reminding their drivers to watch your pit Speed because of a cone change down there and with all the violations we've seen. Matty, and now the spirit of Daytona pit, already making a driver change. Ricky Taylor getting in. No changes on this number 90 machine on their first stop. They made a slight air pressure change in the front to help with grip. Doors being shut. They're topping him off with some Sunoco fuel. Continental tires on. Now, clear, 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 and he's clear. away. He just stalled. Looks like the O2 stop may have taken a couple of seconds longer and he got leapfrogged in the pit there by the 10 car and the six. So I think when things like shake out, he'll probably drop to the fourth spot if everyone does decide to pit. Well, and no changes on the 90, as you heard Matty say, but the biggest change has been during the off season. You heard him say Ricky Taylor climbing behind the wheel. So Ricky Taylor gone from his father's team, replaced over there by his younger brother. And this is a big deal. It is a big deal, and there's been a lot of driver changes in the offseason. In fact, only the Gainesville car of all of the Corvettes out there had the same driver lineup for this year. Ricky Taylor's moved to the 90. His uh, young brother, Jordan Taylor, has been drafted into the 10 car. Talk about the Action Express team. They've really cleaned house. Only Joao Barbosa remains from the driving lineup of last year. They brought in Christian Fittipaldi and the Frizzell brothers on a full-time basis. So a lot of change there. Westy is going to be joined by Ricky Taylor. I think it'll be tough for the championship. But Ganassi boys looking strong, Chris. Yeah, Scott Dixon out of the O2 car after about an hour and a half behind the wheel. And Scott, listening to drivers out there, one thing I'm hearing is the track a little bit tight right now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, early on for sure. And I think, you know, when we were in that traffic and trying to get past them, it made it even worse. But I think, uh, you know, the target Telmex car, both, both of them seem really fast, you know. And, and I was saving fuel, trying to be a little more hesitant. Uh, got caught out on the start there in the limiter. 
What, what happened with that? Well, I thought Scott went, so I went, then I slowed down, and then and then uh, with the engine, it just got caught in the limiter, so it wouldn't go anywhere. They had to pull second, and away we went, but that's uh, just the way it goes. But I think all in all, uh, car's in a good shape, and, and I think we have some good speed for later on in the race. We've got almost twice as many GT cars out here as prototypes. How is the traffic? It's, uh, you know, it's manageable. It's, it's like it always is, and, and uh, some guys uh, are better than others. Um, you know, it, it is difficult with some of them, especially with that new class, I think the GTX or, or the, the, the diesels out there. Uh, very slow on the straight, so you catch them at a rapid rate. So it's kind of hard to judge it, you know, when you're coming to the bus stop uh, to not, you know, fall on top of them. So, you know, traffic's the, the, the fun part. I love it out there, uh, and, and you definitely see some sights, but it's been good so far. Well, Scott Dixon, good spirits, smile on his face. Well, after you have a run like he did, you're going to have a smile on your face. And he talked about the challenges, and those will only get worse as we head into the nighttime. Almost 13 hours, or actually just over 13 hours of nighttime here at the Rolex 24. And it is one of the big challenges now. GT cars head to pit road. The pit lane open for GTs. Led by Andy Lally, defending champion here. And uh, all of these GT cars, the different manufacturers, they should take about 35 seconds to get this fuel on board. But I was talking to one of the Audi teams last night. They're a bit concerned about the venting on the Audi R8 as to how quickly they could do a full fill. We'll have to wait and see how things shake out. Give you a good idea of how the crews are going to work here. You can compare Alex Job on the 24, the crew there, versus the Magnus Racing 44 on the right side of your screen. So the fuel obviously goes into a totally different area of the race car. Front hood on the Porsche. Left corner, left rear corner on the Audi. And Audi has spared no expense. That is the same fueling setup on the Audi R18 prototype that they run at Le Mans. So and it has taken a long time to get that fuel in. Andy Lally now down and away. There you see it, a little bit slower. He stopped a little bit earlier in pit lane, and he lost precious seconds there. That could play out over the course of 24 hours, Brian. We'll be back to the green, and when we do, it'll be Bob Varsha, Justin Bell, Tommy Kendall, who take you to the green. We'll be back to more from the Rolex 24 at Daytona.